Hello and welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Mark Gillen of the 128th District in Berks and Lancaster Counties. As part of my duties in Harrisburg, I proudly serve as a member of the Aging and Older Adult Services Committee. We study a number of issues related to our seniors, such as consumer protection, long-term care, and state programs with the goal of making Pennsylvania the best place to call home. Joining me to discuss the work of the committee is its chairman, Representative Tim Hennessy. Representative Hennessy, welcome. You're, Thank you, Mark. You're my neighbor. We are indeed. We, we share a border. Tell we us do. a little bit about that. Well, that's the Elverson area. I represent the area from the middle of Western Chester County. It used to include Coatesville and Valley. I don't have that now, but everything else from West Sadsbury up to Elverson and then across to uh, near Spring City. And then as a result of the recent reapportionment and redistricting, uh, I basically captured the, the bottom half of the southern half of the borough of Pottstown in Montgomery County. So you know you're cross county. I am. Yep. Two different committees to answer to and all that, all the doubling of the effort. That's, that's, but it's fun. It is. I was at the Lancaster Chamber of Commerce uh, breakfast because I've taken a portion of Lancaster County uh, myself. And though I'm guessing it's a rather de minimis uh, portion relative to the size of the entire district, I know you spend a lot of time and energy on it because you've got a Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce. And when I look sure. down and at Lan Lancaster right. County, I've, I've got a, a farm apparatus, intermediate unit. So it's really a little bit like taking on a part-time job. Well, it's just a lot of the same effort, but just in a different direction and trying to learn new personalities. The, the public officials you have to work with and the, you know, the, right, the right people to call for the, for the information you need. And you've always been committed to doing that. I know we share the Twin Valley Fire Department there, and you and I have been at a number of events together. Yeah. And so those cross-pollinating opportunities, I think, are excellent for legislators. And speaking of that, we also share the Twin Valley School District. Right. Because it is a cross-county line uh, school district. And so I'm absolutely thrilled to serve with you in the Elverson area in that community. Well, well thank you. You're very kind to say that. Um, Tim Hennessy, personally, family, what drives you? Where did you come from in life? Well, I was born and raised in the Pottstown area in northern Chester County, but right out across the river from Pottstown. Uh, what drives me in life? Uh, just trying to be. I've you met know, your wife. As, I, you know, that's a driving to, force. Try to be as good a, a family man as I can. My, I've been married to my wife, Carol, my lovely wife, for 40 years, mm -hmm. and I have three children, all grown and out. And, uh, uh, sometimes my oldest daughter has spent a lot of time in the Middle East, uh, you know, and um, luckily right now she's out of Sana'a in Yemen, the capital mm -hmm. city of Yemen. After five years, she's she's living in England right now, and uh, and I have a, a younger son, or you know, the second son, second child is my son. Mm -hmm. You've met him, Tim. Sure, he's yeah. A big tall guy. He is. The former speaker said he's a taller, thinner version of me. <laughs> uh, and then my, my daughter, youngest daughter, works at QVC in Westchester, outside of Westchester. I think one of the things that people respect about you, Representative Hennessy, is the fact that you're out in the community. I see you doing things. I, I see a level of activity that's almost unprecedented for the representatives I intersect with. But something else I noted, because I do the same thing myself. I try to bring my wife out to events. And oh, God, yes. I know that the last function that we were at together at dinner with the Twin Valley Fire Department, your wife was there. I know part to keep an eye on your little babysitting. <laughs> well, she tries to keep me, uh, you know, from making too many bad jokes. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm noted for making jokes and trying to make light of uh, conversations so that, uh, you know, just people can enjoy themselves and, and you know, right. not be nervous. And it, it's a cute story. Yesterday we were having a, a hearing and this one fellow said, I've never done this before. I'm so nervous. I said, just relax, sit back. Hey, Charlie, check to make sure the electric wires are on and <laughs> connected to that chair. And everybody laughed and he, he sort of relaxed and, and it went pretty smoothly. So, yeah, humor takes, you know, takes me a long way. Yes, I think it serves you well. Unfortunately, for purposes of this interview, we can edit out any of the jokes that we don't like. Only the bad jokes. Right. Edit those out. <laughs> You've been the chairman of the Aging and Adult Services uh, now uh, for a couple terms. When did you come into the House? When did you assume the chairmanship? I began my service in the House in 1993. 
uh, I became the minority chair at the time, I think it was 2007, um, the minority chair of aging. I, you know, I expected fully to be the majority chair, but you know, I think we, we were one vote down on the Republican side, so that, that relegated me to the, being the minority chair. And I served with Phyllis Mundy from Luzerne County, Representative Phyllis Mundy. And, and she was, you know, very, uh, very knowledgeable, very uh, hard worker. And we got along pretty well uh, once we got to know each other, and, and uh, we got uh, some good things done, we think. Before we get into the specific work of the committee, you've been in since 93. You've seen a lot of changes. Oh, gosh, yes. How much has this body changed through the years? Well, I think we're much more transparent, much more, uh, I would say, responsive. I think we were always responsive. Uh, the, the biggest thing is trying to keep up. You know, if you try to, as you know, you try to keep up with your mail, it used to be that we, we would get reams of paper uh, every week on our desks, uh, you know, back in the office trying to just, just for correspondence. And, and now it seems like it's doubled or tripled with the, the uh, advent of email. And I don't know how many you get, but I probably get 200 emails a day and just trying to sort through those and, and, and respond to the ones that really need to be responded to uh, takes, takes quite a bit of time. I can't imagine your workload because I get the several uh, hundred of emails and occasionally a letter and a phone call as well, but I'm not a committee chairman. Uh, I've got my four committees, but I know there's a substantial workload that you take on as a committee chairman. Has that changed through the years? I, you know, I, being there's a there's a monumental difference between being a minority chair, which I was for four years, okay. and then the last four or five now uh, as the majority chair. But I'm blessed with uh, two ladies who are wonderful. Uh, Sharon Schwartz, the executive director of the committee, has been on that committee or with that committee for about 20 years, I think. So she, you know, she's one of those people who's forgotten more than I'll ever know about the system. <laughs> and, and, it's a, and, and Aaron Robb, her, the research analyst, uh, they work well together. They keep me informed of the things I need to know in order to make the committee run smoothly. I'm glad you brought that out because I suspect for the average person out there viewing this program, they don't know the substantial role, both in terms of uh, expertise and keeping things moving, that some of those staffers uh, play. And I know they are omnipresent when we're having committee meetings or preparing, or as we did the other day, uh, we sat down and was pre-meeting preparation. So we appreciate what they provide us in the way of briefing and materials. Prior to becoming a chairman, minority or majority chairman, you were on other committees. Could you open up that portal just oh, for sure. a minute? When I first came up, I was on the Judiciary Committee, the uh, Urban Affairs Committee, uh, local government, and aging and youth, perhaps. I, I forget exactly. It's well, been a we're long going time back ago. a long time yeah, now. It really yeah. is. Uh, as you, when you get to be a chairman, you get basically one other committee. And during you know, the time I've been chairman, generally I was on local government because I came from a, a background of being a, my municipal solicitor or being a municipal solicitor in my, in my home township for about 15 years before I came here. Uh, so I drew on that experience and, and stayed with the local government committee. And now I'm on uh, a transportation committee. I'm excited about that because it gives me a chance to try to deal with some of the road projects that we, we you know, so desperately need to get fixed down in, and finished down in, uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania. When you came into the House, I know you're extraordinarily passionate about aging issues today. Um, in 1993, 1994, did you ever envision yourself being in this position and such a strong advocate for the elderly? Not really, because frankly, it was not a committee that I was assigned to and, and I didn't really understand much about the workings of the system. Um, once you get, you know, when you, when I became appointed as chairman of the uh, aging committee, then you have to delve into the uh, almost a labyrinthine system of, uh, of different programs and, and different uh, qualifications uh, that, that people have to meet in order to be serviced by these programs. Uh, it is, it, it's really a challenge to get to, every time I think I understand the system, somebody says, no, 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 <laughs> you've got that wrong. And, and it, it's a system that's sort of interesting in the sense that uh, a lot of uh, what, what people uh, 
can qualify for is based on an assessment that's made to determine whether or not our seniors, a particular person who's a senior, is what's called NFCE, Nursing Facility Clinically Eligible. Um, it's an acronym that we get from the federal government, from the Medicare system. And essentially, what they make a determination as to whether or not this particular uh, senior needs uh, nursing facility care. Uh, and then, once, if it's determined that, that they do, then, then you start to back away and say, well, but we have a waiver that would say that you could go to a home, you know, uh, personal care facility instead. Or we have a waiver that says you can stay at home and go to a community uh, provider like the LIFE program mm -hmm. that we uh, mm -hmm. were listening to yesterday at, the, at our committee meeting. Or we can say, uh, you know, we'll get an, a waiver, a waiver in a sense of your right to go to a nursing home. Right. And you can stay in your home and we will provide home care uh, services for you. You're talking about quality of life. And mm -hmm. as we look at the window of all the various committees, um, I think in terms of how we can improve the lot of the average Pennsylvanian. And I would suspect that it brings to your life an enormous amount of satisfaction knowing that senior services are being provided where they're needed. It does, and, and uniformly when you ask somebody, where do you want to go? Do you want to go to a nursing home? Or do you want to stay in your home? Everybody, virtually everybody says, I want to stay in my home. That's where I'm most comfortable. That's where I grew up or I raised my family. That's where I feel you know, most relaxed and, and comfortable. So let me stay there. And we've been able, over the course of the last several uh, sessions, to try to get some legislation that had been bottled up for a while, uh, but allows, it, it, it allows the, some of the family members to be compensated for taking care of, of their family, their relative, but keeping that person, in a sense, by virtue of that home care service out of the nursing home, uh, nursing facility. The nursing facilities are, are much more expensive, mm. and so the longer we can allow people to stay in their homes, we save the, taxpayer, the other taxpayers money, and, and we also make the, el the senior uh, happier because she's with family and friends surrounded in her neighborhood and people can drop by to visit, where it might, as they might not do that if, if she was, you know, at a, a distant facility. I'm going to, in a moment, uh, say a word about property tax and the nexus uh, with the elderly. I've got an 88-year-old mother, and she's in her own home, and she'd very much like to stay. Um, she's in good health. Um, yet there's pressure on our seniors as a consequence of property tax, staying in their home. They're on a fixed income. They're not mm -hmm. going to go out, and they're not going to pick up a part-time job. And so it is demanding the pressure on the property tax side of the equation when you own your own home. Um, property tax rent rebate provides a little <coughs> bit of relief, and I know it's a program you're familiar with and you utilize for your own constituents. Sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the Department of Revenue thinks I'm a little uh, crazy sometimes because I'm <laughs> faxing them, literally faxing them property tax or rent rebate uh, application forms, the, the two-page form, the single-sheet, right. two-sided form. Uh, you know, I fax it in at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the afternoon on New Year's Eve sometimes just because <laughs> somebody calls up at the last minute and says, oh, yeah. we haven't done, haven't done it yet, are we too late? So, you, you know, we go out and, and um, I'll go out and meet with them in their home, fill it out, and then go, get to my house or get to the office and fax it in. And, uh, and the revenue is very, very good about it. They, they try to help us out and they'll try to help as many seniors out as they can through that program. It's, a, it's an interesting program. We only, you take a look at your uh, income and you, have, you only take into consideration half of what a person gets on Social Security. You determine what that half of Social Security plus any other income uh, that, that is uh, designated as, as income to be reported and you find out how much you're going to qualify for in terms of a, uh, a rebate against the property taxes you've paid on your home or the rent that you've paid for an apartment or a living space. Excellent. And we're going to amplify on that in just a moment. Okay. Let's take a quick break. Legislative report will return in just a moment. Did you know 
that in the corridors in the first floor of the capital of Pennsylvania, there are nearly 400 individual mosaics. The idea for creating these intricate tiles was first suggested by Henry C. Mercer in 1902. A year later, he received the commission to prove 16,000 square feet of pavement tiles for the great rotunda and corridors of the new state capitol building in Harrisburg. Mercer set about designing subjects for approximately 400 mosaics. He chose as his general theme the history of Pennsylvania, and he soon realized that his tiles could tell stories. Although the arrangement seems random, the mosaics are very thoughtfully placed in the floor. The tile sequence is roughly chronological, beginning at one end with the scenes depicting the Native Americans. The mosaics progress into the story of European habitation in the New World and encompass the Commonwealth's triumph through process and intervention. Now you know. Did you know that the chamber of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives contains a painting depicting the 24 hours of the day? Located in the center of the ceiling, the mural titled The Hours was created by artist Edwin Austin Abbey. This wonderful masterpiece charts the setting of the sun, moon, and the many stars that grace the heavens. 24 maidens, who each represent an hour of the day, begin each day in light and gladness and ends in solemn drapery carried on still shoulders. Now you know. Welcome back to the program. My guest is Representative Tim Hennessy, Chairman of the House Aging and Older Adult Services Committee. We're having a discussion about property tax rent rebate, and I had mentioned to you a few moments ago that when we send a newsletter out, we mention that, uh, almost inevitably we get inquiry about a program that's really efficacious and helps to keep seniors uh, in their homes. The Pennsylvania Lottery. There's a substantive revenue stream that comes out of that for aging services share some of the important aspects of the lottery program to seniors? Well, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the lottery program funds a, a whole range of programs for our seniors, uh, not the least of which is the PACE and the PACENET programs. Right. Uh, they are, they help with the, the purchase of medicines by seniors. Um, there are income, income limits because uh, with, as with everything else, there, you know, there's a finite number of dollars that, that is made is profit by the lottery and as a matter of fact that was one of the reasons the governor last governor governor corbett tried to look at privatizing the management of the lottery to see if he could generate more money we would have always as a state owned the lottery but he was looking to see if we could find um, some management expertise that would have increased the uh, the, the revenue that was left the profit that was left after the lottery had paid out its prizes and its fees uh, so that uh, for the benefit of our seniors, what we are faced with in Pennsylvania and, and across the, the country is that we're really at this point in time in the second year of a 20 year boom, the baby boomers after World War II are all reaching 65 and 66 and 67, I'm, myself included. Uh, I think I was in the second year uh, when I turned 67 and, and uh, it was actually the second year of that 20 year wave. Uh, and the situation we face is that with an increasing number uh, of, of elderly citizens for the next 20 years, the next 18 years, plus the advances in medicine, our seniors are living longer, uh, but they do need more medication. The PACE and the PACENET program help them. PACE uh, helping the people who have the, the lesser incomes. And as you go from, I think it goes from like 17,000, maybe 14,000 for an individual, 17,000 for a couple, to get into PACE, the PACE program. Then we go up, I believe, to about 34,000 for married couples in the, uh, in the PACE net. Right. So that, but you know, the more people that we bring into the age qualification and the need for medicine, the more people qualify for those programs, the, the more money drains out of the lottery. So that's why the governor was trying to find a way to make it more profitable. But we would have always owned it. I've not observed that on the legislative docket moving forward necessarily that specific proposal. No, not anymore. That was that was uh, jettisoned about a year ago. <laughs> okay. A year and a half ago. And Just clarifying that point. Yes, I, um, no, that was it was Governor Corbett I was speaking. Of. It was his initiative, okay. and uh, we're we're not likely to see that recur recur at all. You and I again have something else in common. We're both baby boomers. 
And I, I roughly configured, I, I've heard the years 46 to 65, 66, some, somewhere in there, right. that, that window of time. Um, baby boomers, uh, they're gonna be putting pressure on the system and we've discussed that, but I think Pennsylvania is somewhat unique. You look at a Pennsylvania, a Florida, and Arizona, look at the percentage of our population, which are senior citizens, and then as we project to the future, an even larger percentage of our population are gonna be needing aging services. Right. Are we gonna be able to keep pace? Are we, yeah, well, we have to keep pace. There's no, it's not a question of, are we going to be able to? We have to find ways, sort of like people say to me, at the federal level, will you know, will Social Security be there? It will have to be there. Congress will have to do whatever it needs to do to keep Social Security alive, because if not, people will be marching uh, on Washington. The elder, the seniors will be wa marching on Washington, uh, along with a large contingent of uh, middle-aged people who are sitting there thinking they're going to look to the to the Social Security system uh, when they get older. Uh, we we have no choice but to keep it to keep these programs afloat. There is increasing pressure as more and more people qualify for the programs. But then, like I said, that's why we were looking at the lottery as a, uh, in, 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 with the uh, intent of making it more profitable, but still keeping it owned by Pennsylvanians. But that, that idea is off the table. And actually, the lottery is doing very well. We did, uh, I think it was HR 205, or there was a, representative, a resolution by Representative Causer that asked us, uh, asked the Legislative Budget and Finance Committee to study the financial hist or health of the lottery historically mm -hmm. and to the current day. And that came back about, I'm going to say about two years ago, probably in the spring of 2013. Um, and what the, what the report said was the lottery is healthy. It's, good. it's healthy going into the future. Just because of the baby boom situation, you, you have to be careful not to increase the, the uh, payouts mm -hmm. of the, for individuals, and you gotta be careful not to change the qualifications so more and more people can qualify until we get a, you know, you know, an expectation of how much every change will cost the lottery. And like I said, we have to pre, you know, make sure we preserve its financial stability for the people who are already uh, receiving benefits from the program. And we're widely regarded as having one of the best run lottery programs in the United States of America. The revenue stream is substantial. Um, Representative Hennessy, do you see any challenges looking forward for our lottery program? There's increased gaming, table games, lots of options out there, and yet the uh, lottery revenue stream has been relatively stable. Do you see anything threatening on the horizon in terms of the growth of the lottery program? Really, I don't. I think that we've been able to weather the storm. Uh, we obviously, the lottery appeals to a different uh, uh, segment of our population than it gets uh, drawn to casinos or to uh, online gaming, if and when that ever happens uh, here in Pennsylvania. We have uh, the fourth largest uh, population percentage of our population uh, you know, over the age of 60 and uh, we, we rank behind Florida and everybody understands that people when they get older often want to go to Florida and avoid the extreme weather like we've had lately. We've both been thinking about going to Florida recently. I, maybe you winter. have. No, I, I'm a Pennsylvania <laughs> true, tried and true. I'm going to stay here. Uh, the cold doesn't bother me too much but uh, uh, let me see the second one I think is Maine Third is, in terms of percentage of uh, the elderly, is West Virginia, and then Pennsylvania. And, and I think that is, yeah. you know, that the, the fact that we have such a, a large percentage of elderly uh, people in our population you know, creates demands on our system that uh, we have to we have to meet. Probably surprises people a little <laughs> bit that Maine and West Virginia are in that mix. Uh, my mother-in-law lives in Florida. And uh, they can have Florida in July and August. I have no appetite uh, for it. But I, yeah, <laughs> I think that, I, as I recall, people say that it's very hot and humid down there. Uh, yes, I recall that myself. I've actually endured it uh, for a few days um, a few years ago. We've had some legislative successes in this committee, and one of them was around the issue of Alzheimer's. And just a couple minutes that we have left, reflectively, some of those accomplishments and maybe looking forward a porthole at uh, where the committee is headed and some of the ambition that it has legislatively. 
Well, Representative Kathy Watson from Bucks County has been a champion of the Alzheimer's uh, study um, resolutions. Mm -hmm. She had a bill in to, to study the, the, prob the Alzheimer's uh, occurrence rate mm -hmm. in, in Pennsylvania and to develop a statewide plan. We almost got that uh, across the finish line, I guess it was in 2012. But the session ended, it didn't make it through the Senate, and uh, or it was amended in the Senate. We mm -hmm. couldn't agree with that in the House. And it, people thought it died, and we'd have to start uh, you know, picking it up again in the 2013-14 in the session. Mm -hmm. Governor Corbett decided you know, to do it by executive order. He thought it was a good idea. He created the uh, a study commission, and and uh, the as a result, I've served on that that, that uh, board or commission, and we created an Alzheimer's state plan, which we've developed over the course of 2013. We've met a, a few times in 2014 to sort of tweak the plan, mm -hmm. but we we're very proud of the fact that we do have an Alzheimer's state plan that, that addresses the needs of that growing segment of our population. Looking forward, um, we all have legislation that we're interested in and is needed to improve the quality of life in the Commonwealth. Um, just fast forward here uh, a few months in the future. What would you like to see signed into law in, in, in this session? Well, one of the things that we're working on and have been working on for a few sessions now, and that to our viewers, that may seem like a long time. One is, and what I hear is, why don't you just get it done? But you really can't. The Older Adult Protective Services Act has not been reviewed for about 20 years. And what we find is every time, it's like squeezing the Pillsbury Doughboy. You know, you, when, you, when you make a change to this part of the, the act, somebody else says, well, that affects me adversely. And you haven't considered this. And so we meet with that group, and we keep meeting with different groups. Uh, Sharon and Aaron, as I said, they're, they're good at, at, at uh, you know, listening to people's concerns and trying to find yeah. the modifications that we can make in the program. Um, so we expect to get that done. We, our committee, and I'm, you know, I'm proud of the fact that we actually, and you know from your experience, there, we work in a bipartisan fashion. Absolutely. We do not, you know, we don't, uh, you know, try to cut anybody out of the process. We listen to, to good ideas, uh, and we passed uh, the guardianship uh, update, which mm -hmm. was an, again a major accomplishment. We we passed the uh, uniform dispute resolution. Uh, Leg legislation back 2012 or 13. Both of those things were major pieces of legislation. Both were unanimous votes, not only in our committee, but when we got them to the floor of the House, it was unanimous in the in committee and in the floor of the Senate, and it signed into law. And that's one of the things that I think that uh, I'm, I'm pleased with. The way we work with both sides of the aisle, you know, we, we managed to get unanimous votes as we had yesterday, you know, a series of unanimous votes on the carbon monoxide requirement for nursing facilities, uh, assisted living facilities, and personal care homes. That'll go to the floor probably next week, soon over to the Senate, and it seems to have, uh, you know, enough uh, momentum that we should see that signed into law very soon by, by Governor Wolf. Thank you, Chairman Hennessy. This committee is about enhancing the quality of life for senior Pennsylvanians, and I'm proud to serve with you on Thank the you. committee. Thank you, my friend. You're welcome. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today's program. I'm State Representative Mark Gill, and if you need assistance with any state matter, please feel free to contact me at my local office or through my website. The address and number will be shown in a moment. Thanks for watching, and please join me next time for Legislative Report. Thank you.